So I want to get into our modern culture here in my opening rant. And uh, Deborah McKay, who uh, uh, is a, uh, a legal observer for Standing Rock, uh, wrote this update. She's a volunteer at Standing Rock. She said, uh, I've just returned from Standing Rock with my mind blown, my heart broken, and my spirit troubled with foreboding of a deepening tragedy. Volunteering as a legal observer with the Water Protector Collective, uh, Legal Collective, I witnessed several confrontations between water protectors, that would be the indigenous people and Native Americans, and law enforcement, the National Guard, sheriffs, and private security. Uh, she goes back to January 18, 19, I observed water protectors with their hands in the air, chanting, hands up, don't shoot, being fired upon at a range of 10 to 15 feet. Tear gas canisters and rubber bullets, uh, rubber bullets are regular bullets covered in rubber, were used to, against unarmed water protectors who had been singing and praying. I observed National Guard chasing water protectors off the Blackwater Bridge, firing at people running away. I heard people choking and gagging from tear gas. I saw access to the water protectors' medical vehicles being blocked. I spoke with medics and water protectors who, who described bullets penetrating flesh and causing terrible injuries, including to one media person who nearly lost a finger when his camera was targeted. I talked with a media person who was told of four media people on the bridge that night. Three had their recording devices shot, and the fourth his hand. I saw a photo of a sheriff aiming a rifle directly at a media woman who was standing apart from the crowd. I heard testimony of the back of the medic pickup truck being awash in blood after evacuating wounded. I watched and then inadvertently became a part of water protectors being forced off the bridge by National Guard who were hiding behind the water protectors' vehicles parked along the road and firing rubber bullets at fleeing people. Many people were shot in the back, the neck, and the head. When uh, LE fired at people at close, law enforcement fired at people at close range, many were shot in the uh, genitals or in the face. I received information about Dakota Access Pipeline Security breaching the shortwave radio channels of the WP with taunts such as, come out and fight like men, you, you, uh, you know, the, the, the slur for gay people, it starts with F, or we will come to camp and uh, F word your women. Literally, this is what the Dakota Access Pipeline Security people said. We're going to come and F your women. She goes on to say the U.N. Committee on Transnational Corporations and Human Rights Abuses was in Standing Rock this week, to, uh, week uh, to take testimony of the many transgressions against people, crop dusters, spraying poison pesticides, fertilizers on the camp, hair samples indicating the presence of these chemicals, people who have been injured, beat up, arrested, strip searched, media and medics being targeted by snipers. One medic told me he stopped wearing his Red Cross vest because medics were being targeted to be shot, praying people being attacked and the refusal of the Dakota Access Pipeline and our government to abide by the rule of law. So that was Deborah McKay's report. Sam Levin is in Cannonball, North Carolina, or at least was uh, when this was published over the weekend in The Guardian. The headline, Army Veterans Return to Standing Rock to Form a Human Shield Against Police. He writes, U.S. veterans are returning to Standing Rock and pledging to shield indigenous activists from attacks by a militarized police force. Another sign that the fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline is far from over. We are prepared to put our bodies between native elders and a privatized military force, said Elizabeth Williams, a 34-year-old Air Force veteran who arrived at Standing Rock with a group of vets late on Friday. We've stood in the face of fire before. We feel a responsibility to use the skills we have. Uh, this is a $3.7 billion pipeline. It is to help bring oil from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico, where it can be refined so that we keep the poisons and, you know, we, well, actually, that, that, that's more of the Keystone Pipeline, but Dakota Access feeds into this uh, so that we keep the poisons and we export the gasoline and diesel fuel to, uh, to China and other countries. Anyhow, this 32-year-old Marine Corps says, we're not coming as fighters, but protectors. He said he was concerned about escalating police violence. Since last fall, police have made roughly 700 arrests, at times deploying water cannons, mace, rubber bullets, tear gas, pepper spray, Private guards for the pipeline have also been accused of violent tactics. So what's going on here? I want to share a, a, a take with you on this. This is sort of based on a worldview that Daniel Quinn laid out in his book, Ishmael, FYI. If you haven't read that book, I recommend you run out and buy a copy right now. It's one of the most amazing books ever. And I wrote about this, this same thing and, and this worldview at some length in my book, The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight. 
the way that ancient civilizations or the way that ancient humans, you know, for three million years, the way that humans and, and pre-humans who, who had culture and language, the way that we viewed the world was we said, we belong to the world. Just like the, the wolves and the deer and the, and the insects and the plants, they all belong to the world. And when our civil, what we call civilization erupted around 7,000 years ago, our revealed religions said, no, 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 that's wrong. The world belongs to us. So we conquered it. And in fact, you know, there's a warning about this. In, in Genesis, Genesis 2.16, the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree in the garden thou may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, what's the knowledge of good and evil? The knowledge of who lives and who dies, the knowledge of the power to destroy. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. It was a warning. And then in Genesis 3.5, for God... Uh, doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So basically we said, okay, we're not living in the hands of God anymore, or the gods. We are the gods. We are not, you know, the world, we were not made for the world. The world was made for us. Now these older cultures were the result, and, and there's, there were millions of them around the world, and there are still thousands, were the result of literally three million years of trial and error, much of it specific to regions and environments. They were highly adaptive and good for survival. And there was a lot of cultural diversity, but there was always this one core story. We belong to the world. So how do we live? And there were, you know, some of these cultures built city-states, some of these cultures engaged in agriculture. This is not about that. This is about this fundamental worldview. Are we, do we belong to the world or does the world belong to us? And then the younger cultures came along and said, you know, there's really only one right way to live. We've got this figured out. We're the gods. We run this world. The world belongs to us, not the other way around. And everybody in the world needs to live this way. In other words, we became evangelists and conquerors. This was a huge mistake. And this is, this is the beginning of the killing of the world. This was the eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, believing now that we're, smart of, we're smarter than evolution. Because all those ancient cultures that believed that, the, the world, that we belong to the world, they, achieved, they figured out their way to live, whether it was you know, uh, the ziggurats that were being built down in what we now call uh, New Orleans, or, I mean, you know, 500 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or whether it was, I mean, you know, just name your tribe, right? Whatever it was. So now we have the Republican Party, intolerant, authoritarian, my way or the highway. That's the epitome of this younger culture worldview that is destroying the earth. Now, the Democratic Party, you know, has, you know, some folks in it that view the world that way. But by and large, the progressive view is, is similar to that, still embraced by the older cultures. In other words, we belong to the world. So let's protect the world. Let's save the world. Let's heal the world. And that's why you're not seeing Republicans supporting Standing Rock and indigenous people. You're seeing Democrats do that and progressives. And fundamentally, if we don't change our story to, you know, we belong to the world instead of the world belongs to us, we're going to destroy ourselves. We're absolutely going to destroy ourselves. So, anyhow, your thoughts on this? This, this is this is serious stuff that's going on, and I, and I'm, what I'm talking about here is a there is a major and consequential difference in worldviews. There's a major and consequential difference between not just between liberals and conservatives, but between older and literally wiser cultures. And this younger culture that we're part of that just wants to rape, rob, and pillage the planet. This is the Tom Hartman Program. That, frankly, people like Steve Mnuchin and, and particularly Mike Pence epitomize. Back with, back with more after this.